Hey, thank you everyone for coming here today for the uh, Making Headless Drupal serverless session. Uh, my name is Vasant Kumar Rajan. I'm a program manager with CloudFront team. And uh, along with me is Woodrow Addington. He's an AWS product manager. And uh, joined with him is Pratik Yadav. He is a software development engineer with uh, Lambda at Edge team. He used to be at CloudFront first, now he's with Lambda at Edge. I'll just give it a few more minutes for people to trickle in. In this session, I'll talk, I'll talk you through you know, one of our media company challenges that we've recently you know, had interactions with. And during that phase, I'll also talk about how headless Drupal actually helped us solve that problem and uh, go into, going into that, then Woodrow would go ahead and you know, explain about, hey, what's uh, Amazon CloudFront? Uh, what does it do as, as a CDN? What does it do for uh, the end users? And then also touch base with serverless compute and what serverless compute is all about and Lambda. And Lambda at edge, what does serverless compute at the edge means for end users? Combining all these three, Woodrow, uh, excuse me, uh, combining all these three, Pratik is gonna go put together, has put together this live demo and show you, hey, this is how we solve this customer challenge. And believe it or not, it's just done, it was just done in two days. It's a simplistic approach, just shows you, hey, these are the challenges, this is what we uh, you know, took to resolve. There are a few other pending things which would be completed as a part of the whole solution as such. This is just to show that how much you could do within two days as a proof of concept for this media company solution. So uh, I just wanna walk you through this journey as a, as a developer for this media company. It's a huge multinational media company. And the company uses Drupal as its core uh, architecture because Drupal in itself, uh, you know, out of the box gives easy authoring and then it does multilingual ready. And recently its web services built in as well. So now as a software developer, you know, you're faced with this uh, conundrum or challenge as such, hey, how am I gonna do this highly scalable, secure and flexible website while doing that also take care of like, you know, various other stakeholders uh, problems that they have put forward like, hey, it needs to be secure, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be uh, performance oriented, personalized, flexible and financially sound as well. If you see here in this case, the one thing that we have commonly heard from you know, the media company uh, website is that they want, to value, they want to maintain this high brand value. Along with that, they want to figure out how to make uh, you know, uh, conversions uh, and conversions later into uh, actual content making money. So let's go touch base with security. You know, security is a top priority irrespective of the size of the company, big or large. Uh, big or small, and how does security come into play when it comes to how to provide secure connection, how to authorize the users, how to you know, uh, uh, make sure that you're not uh, DDoSed by anybody, and uh, SSL certifications, and uh, you know, web application firewalls. Uh, then comes scalability. You know, for a media company, the most important thing is that you have this standard phase of, you know, you know, it's, it's pretty predictable that during the day it's gonna be high uh, availability and during the night it's not as much as used as how it is. But all of a sudden we have this viral content going so popular like it's in um, media, it's in uh, social media. So people start, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to the website and all of a sudden, boom, your, your uh, requests are like thousand, uh, concurrent, uh, thousands of concurrent uh, requests per second. So how are you gonna scale with that kind of a traffic and scale back as soon as the, uh, the, the media is not any more as important as how it was? So how are you gonna uh, you know, make sure that the infrastructure scales with that? Uh, there comes then the performance like, hey, how am I gonna make sure that uh, the viewers are instantly getting the responses? Like today, it's a pretty normal thing to expect for milliseconds response. The moment it you know, goes to a certain threshold, people are not waiting there anymore. They are moving on to the next 
media company giving the content. And comes with that is personalization. How am I going to you know, reach to the specific reader that I have? How am I going to make sure that, hey, during Super Bowl season, I want to make sure that if I'm a Redskins fan, not that you are uh, many here. If I'm a Redskins fan, how am, I, how am I going to make sure that I get uh, you know everything related to uh, Redskins and whatnot? And similarly, uh, how, how about politics? Uh, during a political season, you want to make sure that the person is getting a sense, good sense of real good news of political politics. Uh, flexibility, you know, uh, great content management also means that you have this all of a sudden themes. Which are, uh, which are pretty much tight coupled with what the theme is going to give you. You have the theme limitations along with the data structure as such. So how am I going to uh, break free from that? Uh, then financial, I mean, the most important thing for our media company is that uh, they want to make sure that they, they continue doing the, uh, the high journalism, good journalism that they're doing today, as well as making sure that they are able to convert, as I said to you earlier, convert the visits uh, into actual money. Uh, and these challenges are you know, real, and they are just not only unique to this media company. Uh, you could pretty much put this into an enterprise uh, web solution as well. Everybody wants the stakeholders to be happy. You want to make sure that the uh, users using it are using it, and it's also useful for them. Now, if you see typical monolithic architecture as such, um, you have a, a user uh, hitting a load balancer. And then the load balancer further then you know, diverts the traffic to one or the other node, depending upon your configuration. Then the node goes ahead and uh, checks for cache and persistence from a layer. Then uh, you know, storage for you know, your G, uh, J, JS, HTML, CSS, your assets. And then uh, a database to store your you know, uh, activities like membership level, uh, has a member paid, pay, not paid, is it due, whatnot. And all of this, if you see, are having functions which are like, hey, authentication function, authorization function, and then content management and processing. Hey, how am I going to make sure that when I upload a specific image, it not only fits for this particular screen devices, uh, what about the other ones? What about the bigger size screens? What about the smaller size screens? All of these modules are in this, you know, it's going on and on, repeated again in each of these nodes. And thereby, if you see localization and personalization as a function as well. If you see all of them, they are together, uh, you know, stacked and baked together in one single code repository. That means you have this code repeated again and again and again. And all of a sudden, you want to change your provider. You just realize that, damn it, I have you know, these uh, uh, modules that I need to go and change them. And it, it, it just not only is uh, slowing the developers down, it's also uh, prone to a lot of error. And you know, that's where we see a trend towards you know, headless Drupal. Headless Drupal is where, like, you know, in a traditional uh, Drupal, you have both the back end and the front end managed both by uh, Drupal engines, both the content uh, management engine and the content rendering engine. And if you go headless, here's what you see. You know, the content writers and managers are still able to use their same old trusted content management screens that they're used to, and, provided, uh, and it provides to all these uh, UI and UX uh, designers a new f freedom, like all of a sudden you get this uh, you get the great content uh, available to you, and you got this freedom to move your elements up and down, you know, uh, not only just uh, restricting to a specific theme as such. So front end is stripped away entirely and uh, taken care by the UX UI expert themselves. So uh, headless Drupal out of the box helps solve a lot of these problems. If you see the design flexibility, you know, sometimes close coupling is good, but sometimes it is not that good. That's where a headless Drupal helps you to uh, break, part of our, break part from uh, you know, tight coupling as such. Performance. So let's say that if you really wanted to have a site where it would just churn out static content, you could still do that with headless Drupal. Uh, you know, generate that, template that out, and then publish those static HTML to uh, you know, uh, CDNs that you want to. 
then multi endpoint, hey, what happens like you have these varied visitors, one using iPad, one using you know, Android mobile phone, and all of a sudden you have this gigantic uh, you know, reception uh, desk where it shows this huge uh, 4K monitor. So you, you take care of all this and the UI uh, UX expert just need to agree upon, hey, the mobile developer accepts upon a specific JSON and so as the uh, UI developer for uh, the desktop as well. Uh, many of the benefits that I told you are relative to the Drupal instance that you have. Uh, we've just specifically spoken about traditional Drupal installations, okay? Now, uh, with added this, uh, you know, uh, flexibility, you all of a sudden have some constraints as well. Like, let's not forget the constraints as well. And like, all of a sudden you are worrying like, hey, how do I manage security? How do I manage the granular access level that each user were used to? Um, how are you gonna uh, make sure that whenever you publish a content, it looks a specific way that it was intended to? Because you don't have Drupal anymore controlling that uh, theme anymore. Uh, and who is responsible for reviewing it. So all these challenges pose, uh, which are pretty valid ones, and that's where you know, uh, Woodrow would come here and, and try to answer them with you know, uh, the uh, Amazon CloudFront and Lambda and Lambda at Edge. Woodrow. Thank you, my name is Woodrow. I'm a product manager with CloudFront. Thank you for stopping by for our session today and also for many of you at our booth as well. It's a pleasure to meet many of you. So our session today focusing on making that headless Drupal serverless. We obviously want to talk about serverless and what it means to go serverless and what are some of the benefits you get when you go serverless away from a traditional architecture. Most importantly, we want to talk about how we can enable you to achieve that serverless architecture by using AWS services such as Amazon CloudFront and Lambda at Edge. So there are so many different ways that you can go serverless. There's different aspects of what serverless means. But today we're gonna to specifically talk about serverless compute. And when we're talking about serverless compute, we'll be talking later on about a service called AWS Lambda. But there are four main concepts that I wanna set as a baseline for what it means to be serverless and what are some of those benefits in summary. So first and foremost, is no server management. What this means is that as a serverless architecture, such as serverless compute, it doesn't require you to provision, scale, or manage any servers. And what that gives you is agility um, and the flexibility to build applications and websites that you can think of and that you'd like to test um, with greater speed. Having this automatically uh, managed for you allows you and your developer team to focus on what are more value-added activities for your company, such as, again, focusing on that next iteration of your core product. And being able to reclaim, again, your time and your energy to build, again, that next best iteration, do development workloads and test workloads as well. So, again, as I mentioned, the summary you know, point here is that you have more agility by being able to go serverless and spin up resources as you need it and have those managed on the back end by AWS and again, allow you to be more responsive to the demands that you're seeing within the market. When we're looking at serverless, we also point to built-in availability and fault tolerance, and that serverless web applications have this built-in and fault tolerant um, aspects by default, meaning that you don't have to be an expert in terms of architecting this into your own stack, however it might be. And AWS will also make sure that these resources and these stacks are replicated across multiple regions and availability zones as well. Now, with that, we also talk about the scaling aspect of serverless architecture. And that, again, as Vasant had mentioned, this will automatically scale to meet your needs, however big they might be in the event of a traffic spike, or reduce back down to a regular steady state um, that's more expected or in line with what you um, see on a daily basis. Now, all of this really helps drive it to be a very cost-effective um, solution as well. The main thing here is that you're never paying for unused capacity. There's never a worry about, did I over-provision too many um, servers or data centers to run that test and then never saw the workload to actually meet you know, the demands? And so your utilization on a serverless architecture is going to be essentially 100% in that, again, you're only using IT resources as you consume it as you go. 
So again, we're going to talk more into what is the AWS serverless compute, which is AWS Lambda. So talking about AWS Lambda as the serverless compute offering, what it does, it allows you to run code without provisioning those managed or managing those servers, and again, only paying for the compute time as it's consumed. So if we talk about how this works, the first thing you do is you identify a trigger or a hook for which an action is going to be initiated. And this can come in many different forms, but again, you have the flexibility to identify what that hook or that action is going to be. But this can be such as a uh, change in a data state, a request to an endpoint, or a change in a resource state as well. Now, once you have identified where that hook is going to be and what you're going to action upon, you're also going to write your code to execute upon when that specific event is triggered. And so here, the functions that you write is just plain old-fashioned code that you're used to today. And you're going to upload this into the AWS Management Console on the Lambda Service Console. And now your code and your function is going to sit idle until the event is triggered. And when that event happens, that's when AWS will kick in and start scaling uh, instantly to fulfill the requests and you know, provision the resources that are just right to execute that function. Now, this is an amazingly powerful uh, service that can really alter the way that your AWS stack responds to customer events you know, in a very customized and personalized manner. But we've always looked at how do we take that Lambda functionality and move it to the edge, essentially moving it closer to your end viewers around the world to, again, customize the response so it's fast and secure and highly personalized as well. And this is where, through the culmination of you know, some, several years of work, the Lambda functionality and the CloudFront, which is Amazon Web Services Content Delivery Network, came together and created a new service called Lambda at Edge. This became generally became generally available to the public in July of last year. And so we're really going to get into how Lambda at Edge works and applies to a headless Drupal type architecture. But before we get into Lambda at Edge, we need to set a baseline for what is Amazon CloudFront, because again, that is where the um, Lambda at Edge functions will occur, again, using the CloudFront infrastructure. So when we look at Amazon CloudFront, Amazon CloudFront is AWS's global content delivery network. At its core, a content delivery network, or also known as a CDN, is a geographically distributed group of servers which are working together to provide fast delivery of internet content. And so whether you know it or not, every one of us on a daily basis is interacting with CDNs around the world. Whether you're reading news articles from your favorite news outlet, or shopping online, watching YouTube videos, or browsing through social media fee, uh, uh, feeds, you're usually interacting through some type of intermediary service, which again is that content delivery network, accelerating that connection for you around the world. Now CloudFront as a CDN is highly integrated within the AWS ecosystem, and this comes from two main points. The first being physically integrated with the AWS backbone, which is AWS's private network, um, to really accelerate the data transfer between all of our services um, or also to your origins. And then we're also integrated seamlessly from a software perspective as well with other AWS services. So now you can start to tailor custom solutions and bring things together in a very highly integrated environment and have it all packaged within you know, the AWS um, service as a whole. So CloudFront began in 2008 with 14 edge locations around the world. And over the past 10 years, we've grown to 114 uh, edge locations, um, which are spread across 56 cities and 24 countries around the world. In the past year, we added 39 edge locations. And the best thing about the service in terms of its growth is that it will continue to add more and more edge locations around the world. And so geographic expansion is still something that is going on today. When we look at the architecture that you see here, there's really two types that I'll mention here. The first being the edge location, which are the purple and blue dots. These are providing the first line of caching or storage uh, for your hottest and most requested content. The second type of architecture is the regional edge cache. And these serve as another caching layer that sits in between the edge location and your origin. So it's another mid-tier caching layer. What this does is it allows us to increase your overall cache hit ratio so that, again, we can, we can respond to viewer requests with the content they're asking for, and thus reducing the overall workload on your origins in the back end. 
And so we're going to take a look at how this works in a typical AWS uh, architecture. So if we're looking at something as a simple application architecture or a simple you know, website, there are going to be three main elements that we refer to as you know, the compute, the data store, and some type of storage. Compute could be something like an EC2 instance. It could be a container or a Lambda function. The data store could be a relational database like RDS or a non-relational database as well, such as DynamoDB. Either way, this is where you're going to store and track your user information that's accessing your applications or your websites. And then storage could be something like an S3 bucket, the Amazon Simple Storage Service, where you're going to host a lot of that static asset, such as you know, images or CSS or JavaScript. Now, in our example here, let's say you take that simplified architecture and you have it deployed to a single origin um, in US East 1. What this means is that customers around the world are going to be requesting content, and they're going to be routed across the public internet before they're able to retrieve the content that's been requested. So what this means is that depending on their viewer location, this could result in latency or delays that vary widely. So those that might be closer to your origin might have an OK or a decent latency connection. But viewers around the world may not have that same performance, and it can have a big negative effect on your viewer's experience with your content um, or your website as a whole. This can also result in potentially a higher likelihood of losing those viewer connections. And lost connections could result in customers going to other uh, sites or sources for the content that they're seeking. What this also means is that you have no other outer layer protection in terms of another um, security measure where all viewer requests and potential DDoS attacks are all going direct to your origin and could potentially take that down as a whole. But what happens if you add an Amazon CloudFront? Amazon CloudFront, um, when you add that into your architecture, can be an essential um, part of your cloud infrastructure for creating the highly uh, acceler accelerated and se secure web applications and websites. And what this does is it allows you to move an important part of that simplified architecture closer to your viewers. So if we take a look at just an example, a subset of six of those edge locations among the 114 that we have, what we can now do is move that storage component to the edge, and it allows customers around the world to access cached content that is local um, within their region or within the regional edge cache that that edge location ties to. Either way, it allows us to provide that content closer to viewers instead of backhauling all the way around the world to retrieve that content from the uh, origin itself. But CloudFront is much more than just simplified byte delivery. There's many more benefits that it provides. We talked about that global reach with the edge locations around the world. But it also, again, can really be an essential cloud infrastructure component in building highly secure and highly available uh, websites and applications. There's also a lot that CloudFront can do to help increase the security posture of your infrastructure. It has a lot of inherently built-in uh, security features and integrations with other AWS services. And we'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. But also, we talk about programmability. And this is really where we're going to dive into the second half of the presentation. We're going to talk about how Lambda at Edge transforms CloudFront from being a traditional content delivery network to something that is a programmable content delivery network, where now you as a de developer have a whole new tool set available to you to make uh, customized or highly personalized responses to viewers around the world. Like any other AWS service, CloudFront is scalable in that, again, it will automatically absorb um, the requests that come to it and serve up the content as requested. And again, we'll scale up or scale down to meet your needs as they come in dynamically. The great thing about um, CloudFront that I love so much is the breadth of type of customers we serve. We serve individual developers you know, running their own personalized websites up to some of the largest enterprises that we're all familiar with today, such as uh, Major League Baseball or Samsung. So we have a wide breadth of customers that are all utilizing um, CloudFront because, again, it's highly scalable. It can go as little or as big as needed. It's also cost-effective from the standpoint that pricing is simple. You're only going to pay for the bandwidth and the requests that you actually use. And there's going to be no minimum monthly uh, platform fees for utilizing the service. An added benefit is that if you're using a 
origin within AWS, such as EC2 or S3, the data transfer coming out of those services to CloudFront is free of charge, that there's nothing going to be charged as the information is transferred to CloudFront. The only thing, again, you'd pay for is the request and the data transfer coming out of uh, CloudFront. And there's also um, the AWS free tier usage to get started with CloudFront for free. Now I'm going to touch briefly on the performance and security. On the performance side, many developers are familiar with content deli delivery networks being good at accelerating static content. This is going to be content like the images and the static um, assets such as the CSS and the JavaScript. But CloudFront again can do more by helping accelerate dynamic content that is not either non-cacheable or has short time for lives. CloudFront does this in a number of different ways. As we mentioned, we talk about that AWS backbone infrastructure being able to accelerate data transfer around the world. But also with that localized um, data center, you can now do TCP handshakes that are done closer to the end viewer, again, creating lower latency connections and more reliable connections as well. CloudFront also maintains persistent connections going to our regional edge caches as well as to origins. Again, thus reducing the overhead and repeatedly establishing new connections to your origin. And as I mentioned, with scalability, during any kind of traffic spike, CloudFront can collapse simultaneous requests for cache misses into a single request going to your origin, again, reducing unnecessary load to your origin. But these are just a few examples of many more things that CloudFront does to accelerate the performance of your web applications and your websites. From a security standpoint, we can also improve the security posture of cloud infrastructure. Again, there's many inherently and natively built-in security features that allow you to do things like access control or encryption, either in motion or at rest, and allow you to also customize a lot of these things in the AWS console management or through API uh, calls as well. Again, we're always looking at the regulatory environment as well, because we know many of our customers are subject to different standards. And we, again, seek to make sure that CloudFront is always at the forefront of that, making sure that we meet compliance and exceed that and, again, help our developers and customers meet those standards that they need to uh, address. And then, as I mentioned, the integration with the AWS uh, ecosystem provides a lot of benefits here, such as the AWS Certificate Manager, which will automatically manage your SSL certificates or AWS Shield, which is um, from a standard service, um, is automatically integrated for all CloudFront users. And so you natively already have a layer of DDoS or anti-DDoS protection as well. So when we talk about some of those challenges, again, that the CloudFront uh, service solves for some of these media companies and other customers around the world, is that, again, it can really help with that security and the performance and scalability of applications around the world. But we want to talk about Lambda at Edge as well. And again, when we talk about Lambda, we talked about how do we take this to the edge. So just as a quick recap on what Lambda was, it's an event-driven model where you identify those trigger points. And those uh, trigger points will activate code um, when requested. And AWS will scale to meet that workload as needed. So with Lambda at Edge, what you do is you're, you're going to write your code once in US East 1. And then CloudFront will automatically and transparently replicate that code around the world. And so now what we've essentially done with Lambda at Edge is we've now moved not only the storage component of the architecture to the edge with CloudFront, but now we've moved the serverless compute functionality to the edge as well. So with Lambda at Edge, you're going to get all the same benefits of Lambda serverless compute functionality. And what that, again, means is that you can now program CloudFront to respond in ways that were not possible before. And I'm going to get into the trigger points of where that happens in the CloudFront events. But I'm not going to get into specific use cases, as I'll let Pratik go into that in more detail. But in short, with that compute and that programmability, you now have the flexibility to run code closer to your viewers using CloudFront's global network. Again, as you package these together, you're now able to provide connections that are faster, more secure, and highly personalized uh, for your viewers around the world. The four events that I um, mentioned, or the events that I mentioned where CloudFront can initiate the Lambda at Edge functions happen in four different areas, and that can happen on viewer requests for all requests coming in. It can happen on origin requests where there's a cache missed and it needs to go back to the origin. Then it also can be initiated upon an origin response back to CloudFront. 
And then it can also be initiated on all responses going back to viewers, whether it was, again, based on a cache hit or a cache missed. When we look at what these can do, we now kind of look at it from a standpoint, if you're now moving away from what was a traditional kind of monolithic you know, type architecture to something that is now based on serverless microservices. So that now as requests come back in, you can have different Lambda functions that are dedicated specifically for different services. So now you can just do a specific service dedicated for authorization and authentication. Or you can do something that's just gonna be purely based on image manipulation or something that's going to localize and personalize the content for that viewer as it comes in. And again, this can all be based on different types of origins, whether it's in AWS or not, or as we're talking about today, a headless Drupal site. But flexibility can come in so many different ways, and that's really what Lambda Edge provides, is that additional flexibility. So we talked about headless Drupal providing flexibility, and Lambda Edge now adding on a whole other layer of flexibility not possible on its own. Really, what is great about this is we provide a tool set for our developers to imagine up new different ways that they can incorporate that into their own architecture for their own specific use case. Now, before I turn the time over to Pratik, I just wanted to recap the journey so far as we, again, started off with the media company challenges that we had talked about. The challenges included things like the security, the scalability and performance, and flexibility. And now as we look at the anatomy of what makes up a media company's website, we can now start to see how a headless Drupal, a CloudFront uh, distribution, or Lambda at Edge serverless compute functions can now start to provide the solutions for each of these challenges that we face today. First, you're gonna have headless Drupal that's gonna be providing that core content. And that's where, again, you can start to utilize that content in different ways depending on your viewers. You're gonna have CloudFront here helping out with that, both the static and the dynamic content, but also increasing the security features um, of your infrastructure as well. And then lastly, you're gonna have Lambda at Edge coming in and being able to provide that compute functionality for customized viewer experiences. I'm now gonna turn the time over to Pratik to dive deeper into use cases for Lambda at Edge and Headless Drupal, and also go through a live demonstration on how these three things are integrated and how we did it. And um, we'll share it with you now. Thank you. Thanks, Woodrow. Um, so before we jump into the details of Lambda at the Edge, uh, let's uh, uh, look at a simple uh, a demo we put together uh, in uh, two days, just to show you. Uh, give you a glimpse of what's possible with Lambda at the Edge. So, uh, let me pull this up. All right, so I have this simple website, which is, as you can see, running behind CloudFront. Uh, uh, and I am displaying some articles here, which are tagged as these three different categories. Uh, this is a landing page of my uh, dummy website. Um, all these articles are actually uh, uh, being managed in uh, Headless Drupal, uh, all the content. Uh, but apart from that, whatever else you see here, uh, there are no servers behind it. It's all serverless running with Lambda at the edge. Uh, also on the top left, uh, I am displaying this hello string. Uh, uh, I'll show you, uh, I, have also, I also have created three dummy users. Uh, let me actually try to do a login. So I've created a dummy user uh, as myself, and I am interested in different set of articles. So this is how my landing page looks like. So as you can see now, I am being also displayed edge articles because uh, I'm interested in that category as well. And as you can see on the top left, uh, I am being greeted by hello uh, in my preferred language, which is Hindi. Um, Ideally, I could have also translated all the articles uh, uh, to my language as well, but just for the simplicity uh, for this demo, I'm just doing this. Uh, but everything that I showed just now happened uh, uh, inside Lambda, and I don't have any servers running anywhere. And it's happening close, closer to me, so probably uh, this is running in Ohio, where we have, I think, the closest uh, data center. Uh, let me also try to log in as my friend Woodrow, who has different set of interests. Um, and as you can see, uh, his landing page is personalized for him, whatever he's interested in. And his uh, preferred language is, uh, 
Anybody? Portuguese, Portuguese. yeah. Um, all right, so I'll go dive deep into uh, how I have set these things up. Uh, but before that, let me jump on to the slides and to show you guys, uh, give you a more detailed uh, dive deep into Lambda at the Edge. And then we'll come back and uh, see how I have set up these things. All right. So there were, th uh, there were three things I was doing in that demo. First was uh, using Lambda at the Edge. Uh, first was authorization. I was trying to uh, authorize all these viewers who are trying to log in and trying to serve them uh, and trying to validate uh, whether they are uh, authorized users or not. Other thing I was doing uh, inside my Lambda at the Edge functions uh, was content aggregation. So I was fetching content from Drupal on the fly for each of these requests. And based on what the user is interested in, uh, I was trying to display a different content. That processing is also being done in Lambda at the Edge. And the third thing uh, I was doing in there was personalization, uh, which was translating these uh, strings into the language which the user is interested in. And again, those conversions were happening on the fly uh, in line with all the requests. So let's dive deep into Lambda at the Edge. So we'll, we come back to this diagram again because uh, this is where uh, it explains you in nice detail uh, where we have these all four events which get triggered uh, within CloudFront. So let's uh, take a look what happens at an edge location when uh, CloudFront receives a request, right? So CloudFront cache is a big blob in this picture, uh, but in general it's a much more evolved and uh, complex cache. But for our purpose, we can treat it as a giant blob. So when a request uh, uh, arrives at a closest edge location in CloudFront, uh, CloudFront tries to look it up in the cache. If it's not in the cache, it's a cache miss, and CloudFront goes to the backend to fetch your content. Uh, CloudFront knows which backend to go to because uh, uh, when you configure CloudFront, you tell which you, you point it to your backend, and when uh, it gets the response back from your backend, if it's cacheable, it, it caches it and serves serves it to the viewer. Now, what we have done with Lambda at the Edge is we have introduced these four points where you can actually intercept these requests and customize or manipulate them as you like. So at these points, you can attach a function uh, where, wherein you can run any code you want. Uh, and these events would be triggered automatically uh, uh, every time a request for, uh, hits CloudFront. So we have four events in here. Uh, the first one is via request event. Uh, these events happen when uh, your viewer rec uh, requests uh, hit CloudFront. And this will happen for each and every uh, of request which uh, uh, hits the CloudFront from your viewers. Uh, then we have origin request events. Uh, these events only happen for cache misses. misses and uh, uh, these events would be triggered when CloudFront is trying to fetch uh, content from your backend. And again, you can in, inside those functions, you can actually manipulate these, change these requests which CloudFront is making to your back, backend and uh, uh, do whatever you want to like with them. Uh, then we have origin response events, which will get triggered when CloudFront receives a uh, uh, response from your backend, and then viewer response events when CloudFront tries to serve content from the cache. So Lambda at the Edge provides you this uh, generic compute uh, platform, which is serverless, and which is running globally. Uh, all the functions are replicated globally. You just write them once and uh, upload it to uh, uh, Lambda at the Edge. Uh, it takes care of replicating these functions globally and uh, running them uh, closer to your viewers. Uh, let's quickly glance over some of the properties of viewer request event because it'll help us uh, understand better when we'll come back and look at the setup of that demo. Uh, so these are some of the properties of these events. They are executed on every request uh, uh, from your viewers. Uh, this, and uh, you can modify cache key in here. For example, the request URL, cookies, headers, query sting, and as a result of this, you could potentially serve different objects from the cache uh, based on the request. So this is what uh, lets you achieve that. You can perform stateless authentication and authorization in these events. Uh, uh, this is the right place to do it because it happens for every request. So um, you can do network calls in these functions. And you can not only reach out to an AWS service, but any endpoint over the network. Uh, and what this lets you do it. Uh, you can talk to other services, you can talk to a DB and like fetch more details about this viewer or user. 
And this is one of my favorite features. You can generate entire responses in CloudFront. You, you need not have a running backend as well. You can sort of uh, create all these customized responses on the fly for your viewers from your code. Uh, you use them, for example, you can use them for uh, generating your viewers from HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, so you can craft a custom response. So is, uh, if this user is using HTTP, I'll uh, generate a 302 redirect and uh, send him to HTTPS version. Uh, you can deny access to illegitimate users here by inspecting whatever authorization cookies and uh, redirect them maybe to a landing page, uh, which is a default login page or something or whatever. Uh, let's look at one of the specific uh, use cases which we can achieve using Lambda at the Edge, and which is what I'm doing in my demo as well. So one of the requirements of media companies is to do authorization, right? For instance, when they have to implement some sort of paywall, they have to do some sort of authorization, uh, whether the viewer is allowed to view the paid content or not. As Vasan said, uh, in monolithic applications, everything is baked into a single application. But with uh, the advent of microservices, you can potentially offload some of these things uh, to the edge itself. Uh, let's define authorization, right? Uh, we can say it's a way of specifying uh, access rights uh, to your resources at your backend. But why would you want to do at the edge, right? There are multiple benefits. First is latency. Because CloudFront is running these functions closer to your end viewers, you're reducing response time to your viewers. Uh, second is load on your origin. By offloading uh, some of these uh, potentially heavy crypto operations, uh, uh, you are reducing some load on your origin as well. And last is uh, security. Uh, because you can filter out some of these illegitimate or unwanted requests right at the edge itself, they'll never even reach your infrastructure. Uh, these are some of the benefits uh, of doing authorization at the edge. And here is one way of setting it up, right? Let's say you have a, leak, uh, you have a viewer who is trying to view your content and he queries CloudFront distribution, I can have a viewer request function. And from inside that function, uh, let's say you already have some kind of entitlement service, legacy entitlement service, which is running, which you already use. Uh, and you do not want to, uh, you want to still keep using it. You can just make HTTP request that entitlement service from your function, which is running at the edge. And it'll tell you the access decision. And based on if there's OK or not, you can go to your backend or generate a custom paywall message or 403 at the edge itself. Uh, I can also do it another way, uh, statelessly, uh, by using JSON Web Tokens, for example. Uh, JSON Web Tokens are a self-contained way for uh, securely sharing information between parties. Uh, you can uh, encrypt them, you can sign them, and you can embed any information in there. So if you want to do it statelessly, this time your function itself, now you don't, want to, don't have to talk to any entitlement service. Your function has access to the public key. It can itself validate the token and do the authorization. And depending on the result, it can uh, go out to your backend or generate a three, 403 or 302. So uh, let's also look at a sample JSON web token. This is the actual token payload, which I'm using as part of my demo. Uh, that's why I just put it here. Sorry. So as you can see, I have this scope where I'm, I'm embedding this information that this user, Vasant, is interested in these articles, compute and edge, and its preferred language is Japanese. Uh, this is the information I'm storing in tokens. And based on this information, statelessly, I'm trying to fetch content from Drupal and personalize the final response. Let's also look at some of the properties of uh, origin request events. So these events are executed on CacheMess. As you said earlier, you can also make network calls here. You can dynamically select origins based on request in these functions. And what that lets you achieve is uh, there are multiple use cases which open up uh, uh, because of this feature. We'll talk about this feature in more detail later. Uh, but you can, re uh, you can also rewrite URLs. Uh, so you can prettify your URLs for your viewer. Uh, you can generate responses again in these events as well. Uh, but this time, they'll be cached because these events happen behind the cache. So whatever content you generate in these events would eventually get cached in CloudFront, and your subsequent uh, viewer requests would just serve it from the cache, and your functions will not be invoked. And let's look at, look at a specific example of content aggregation. Uh, sorry, origin request events. I call it content aggregation, and this is what exactly I'm using in my demo. Uh, I have uh, my users coming in, which have their preference of what information they want to see. 
and I'm going out to Headless Drupal to fetch all the content with the tags and filtering the stuff which my users are not interested in and generating an a entire response page uh, inside the function itself. So uh, I call this as a personalization feature, right? Because you are personalizing this content which is very unique to the viewer who's trying to view your page. And this personalization usually involves two things. First is identifying who the user is. And second is some information about this user in which you are interested. This information can be uh, uh, specific to this user, like uh, 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 his interests or his, uh, what the content he has paid for. And it can also be uh, specific to a group of users, like uh, the, the geographical location of your users or the device type they are using. And based on all these information pieces, you might want to build a very customized response uh, for your viewers. Uh, so as I said, this is what exactly I'm doing in my demo as well. I'm actually validating and parsing the token I'm receiving in the request, fetching uh, the uh, tags this uh, viewer is interested in, and based on that, uh, I'm sending aggregated response to the client. Uh, you can also do a full attempt body generation in these functions. Uh, you can generate full HTML responses by making use of templates. For example, I can have static templates which I store in S3 bucket, and uh, I can have my actual data in some sort of DB and query them both from my origin request Lambda function, uh, combine them together, generate a render template, and cache it in CloudFront. Uh, I have just put this example here uh, for the sake of completeness. One example can be using mustache templates. Uh, mustache can be used for HTML, config files, uh, and anything. Uh, it works by expanding tags in a template uh, using values provided in, the, in, in a JSON object. So I can have a mustache template and combine with a JSON from DynamoDB or MongoDB and generate the full uh, page. I also put a code snippet in here uh, for this specific example. Uh, just to show you guys, this is all the code which you need for generating these templates. So I'm just querying S3 and Dynamo here. S3 has my templates, Dynamo has the actual data. And I'm just using mustache to directly generate a 200 and give it back to CloudFront. That's all uh, I'm doing here. So this is an entire function uh, which actually uh, run, you can run at the edge. So let's go back to our demo again and try to see how I set up things uh, 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 behind the scenes. So, so I have this uh, I have this Drupal instance running in my EC2. As you can see, I'm on the content page. And all I have these articles, uh, which I was trying to display on my page. And if I go to the views uh, tab on my Drupal, uh, I have created this REST API, which exports all the articles in JSON. And if I go to this, uh, this is the whole JSON, which I'm actually fetching. And if I look at it in the pretty printer, so as you can see here, I have these uh, title and body of the actual content, and ha I have these field tags which tells me which uh, category they belong to. And this is all I have in my Drupal. And I'm fetching this uh, every time when a request makes, a uh, viewer makes a request. And based on these tags, I'm uh, crafting a different response. Now let's go back to the function itself, where all the stuff is happening. So I am in my, I am logged into my AWS console. This is the Lambda console. This is the actual function I'm using. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the entry point for my function. So whenever an uh, event happens in CloudFront, this, this method gets called. As you can see, uh, I have three parameters. Event is the parameter which has all the details about this specific request. Uh, this is how I fetch the request from this event. It has all the properties like what all headers this request had, the URL, cookies, everything. Then the, you have this context, which is something, uh, which is a context specific to this event, like request ID and stuff. And then you have this callback, which you can use to instruct CloudFront uh, to apply your modified request or responses back. 
So as you can see here, I just have three cases in here, which I'm trying to handle. First is the default case, uh, when this user is not logged in, I am just fetching content from Drupal, and then just trying to display top three articles. Uh, second case is when he's actually trying to do a login, as you can see, I'm trying to check that. And then in that case, I'm just acting as a pass-through service. I, I'm, already, I'm also running this authorization service separately, just for the simplicity of this demo. I could have also put all the logic in here where I'm generating these tokens by talking to a DB. But in this case, I'm acting as a pass-through. I send the request forward it to authorization service, get the response, and send it back to client. And in this response, it'll set up the cookie itself, and then just sending back a 200, generating an entire response in here, uh, telling CloudFront to use my response instead of the actual one. And that's all I'm doing here. And this is, uh, my lab this is what my Lambda function looks like. Uh, I'll also, also show you the CloudFront distribution, uh, which I have set up. It's, it's just this one distribution I have in my account. I'm just pointing it to, uh, I have these paths I have created in here, uh, two for login and one for articles. And then inside them, it's all default values. Nothing I have changed. The only thing I have done is I have associated this function with a viewer request event type. Uh, ideally, I, I should have done this in origin request event type because I am fetching this content. I want to cache it in CloudFront. But for the demo, I didn't uh, want to deal with all the cache headers. That's why I have associated with viewer request. Uh, so that's all I have done in CloudFront. I have just created a distribution and went there and associated this function with the uh, event type. So this is th this is all the setup there was, and uh, it lets you, uh, as I showed, generate this highly personalized uh, content for your viewers, and you can also do authorization at the edge. And these are only uh, uh, one of the few examples that you can achieve using Lambda at the edge. And I focused on these things because these are some of the common themes which we see our customers want to do uh, at the edge. Uh, but now we'll go back and see what are some of the other things you can do and quickly go over uh, uh, other things which we can do. So, so, so what are all the other things which you can do with Lambda at the edge? So these are, this is just, this is not an exhaustive list. This is something, I just put it up there to give you guys an overview of uh, uh, the common use cases people try to use it for. Uh, you can definitely create highly personalized websites where uh, your website is unique to a viewer if you want. Uh, you can do response generation uh, inside these functions. You can do URL rewrites, access control, and remote network calls, A-B testing, and dynamic origin selection. Uh, let's spend some time on dynamic origin selection because it lets you, uh, uh, it opens up a lot of cool use cases which, which you can achieve using Lambda deals. Uh, before that, just also look at how you can prettify URLs for user API experience. Uh, one example would be map tiles. Uh, this is fairly standard, there is a fairly standard way of uh, creating URL scheme for map tiles. But let's say if you want to decouple them uh, from the way you generate or store map tiles at your backend. You can just, uh, in your origin request Lambda functions, rewrite the original URL and go, uh, inside, go to the actual object in your backend, and then again cache in CloudFront using the actual URL. Uh, now let's come to origin selection part. Why would you want to do origin selection at the edge itself, right? So there are multiple cases, right? Let's say if you have a multiple origin setup. Uh, you are running your st service stack in multiple regions across the world, and you want your users to go to the uh, nearest uh, uh, region. You can do that by uh, choosing on the fly what origin you want to go to for this request. Uh, you can load balance across origins. Uh, you can do a controlled rollout changes of your, uh, if you're making changes at your origin, uh, you can do a controlled rollout by using A-B testing or uh, blue-green origin deploys. And all this code, you only need to run in Lambda at the edge, so you don't, you don't need to provision any servers. And let's say if you are using uh, A-B testing, uh, you can just write uh, your code once for this feature, and once you're done with A-B testing, uh, uh, you don't pay for any more uh, compute. Uh, when you're migrating between our origins, for example, from on-premise to cloud, you can slowly uh, move your traffic uh, 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 from on-premise to cloud by using these Lambda functions where you route your users to uh, uh, your origins. Uh, 
And the way you do origin selection is very simple. I have actually put an actual object with CloudFront exposes as, as the origin information which he is going to talk to. And you just have to modify the domain name and put any domain name in there which is uh, on there, uh, which is out there on the internet. And if you send this back to CloudFront, CloudFront will take care of going to this new origin. Uh, this is one of the things, as I said, you can do using origin selection, which is A-B testing. You can rely on cookies. Uh, uh, if there is an active, you have already established a session. Otherwise, if the user is coming in for the first time from inside your Lambda function, uh, you can throw a dice and send him to uh, one of the origins and set the cookie. Again, this is, an whole, this is the whole code I have put in, in here just to show you guys. Uh, how simple it is just to write a couple of lines of code and deploy to Lambda at the edge and you get your A-B testing. Uh, another example would be, let's say you are a SaaS provider and operating in a single regional endpoint and let's say you want to uh, expand worldwide. You can do that by slowly deploying your service in different regions and have uh, this functionality inside CloudFront you are slowly routing users uh, to your new regional endpoints. Um, or you can route them based on uh, their home region. Let's say you have a user DB uh, where you store this information about which region they belong to and then based, you set the cookie when they come to you for the first time and then based on uh, this information, all the subsequent requests, uh, you always route them to the nearest region. You can route based on user <coughs> agent. If it's a, a mobile viewer, desktop viewer, if let's say you are running different stacks uh, at your back end for rendering all these different applications, you can do this logic in Lambda at the edge. To, you can look at the user agent and route the request to the correct origin. Uh, as I said, you can generate redirects, uh, but for example, you can redirect to viewers uh, based on their country. Uh, for example, if they are coming from Germany, you can redirect them to example.com slash de subpage. Again, this is uh, one of the examples I've put in there just to show you uh, it's very simple just to write this code up. Uh, you can do image compression on the fly. Uh, these are just some of the things which you can do. I've just put it here for the sake of uh, showing how generic the service is. You, uh, it's not tied to any use cases. A lot of our customers are already doing a uh, lot of cool things and uh, it really opens up uh, it really opens up CDNs for programmability. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do inside your CDN. So, uh, re, uh, doing a recap, what we saw was uh, all these challenges which, uh, which are definitely not unique to a media company website. These are some of the challenges which are faced by uh, anybody who is trying to uh, uh, create a web app or a website. And we saw how some of these things like security, uh, performance and scalability uh, you get out of the box by using just CloudFront. And with Lambda at the edge, now you can also add, uh, we can say you can also have flexibility and personalization in the mix as well. Uh, this allows you to provide more faster, more secure and highly personalized viewer experience for your uh, website. Uh, I have also put in some getting started resources in the slides as well. If you guys are interested, uh, you can just uh, go ahead and uh, follow these getting started guys. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, thank you guys for coming here and joining us. Thank you for taking your time uh, for listening to what is serverless and what is CloudFront Lambda at the edge. Uh, uh, thank you. Just real quick, we're, we're going to put the slides as a resource on SlideShare and so just keep a lookout for that for the next few days. Um, and then we'll also be following up if you stop by our booth and we can scan your badge. Well, again, also we'll follow up with additional resources as well. Um, if you have any questions and you'd like to come up and speak with us, we'll be here for a few more minutes. And uh, thank you again for joining us.